Good morning, everyone. The topic for today is chronic arthritis media, mucosal variant. Myself, Dr. Ganesh, Assistant Professor from the Department of ENT, Sri Lakshminarayana Institute of Medical Sciences. Moving further, the, we will be seeing the topic under the following headings definition, etiology and epidemiology, pathological types, pathological changes, clinical features, investigations, and treatment option. Definition chronic arthritis media is a, a stage in the disease where there is chronic infection of the middle ear cleft, especially eustachian tube, middle ear, and the mastoid aerosol system in presence of a persistent tympanic membrane perforation. This is the WHO definition in case which was given in the year 1998. Epidemiology among Indian population, 1,000 for rural population, 46 persons are affected by chronic arthritis media in case of uh, rural population, whereas in case of urban, it is 16 persons per 1,000 population. This is the gross difference between the rural and the urban population and the prevalence. Coming on to the etiology, etiological aspects for chronic arthritis media, mucosal variant, you have environmental etiology, wherein uh, environment plays a, play a major role in the development of chronic arthritis media, infective part, previous history of arthritis media, iatrogenic causes, genetic and immunological causes, upper respiratory tract infections, allergy, eustachian tube, malfunctions. Moving on to the etiological classes, environmental. Low socioeconomic status has been documented as one of the important aspects for development of chronic arthritis media. Because of low socioeconomic status, what is happening is there is uh, so much overcrowding over there. There is so much uh, uh, indwelling of this uh, people in and around there. There is so much... Uh, Cross infection, there is a, a more amount of exposure for upper respiratory tract pathogens leading on to middle ear cleft as well as the middle ear as the nidus of infection for this uh, uh, mucosal arthritis media to get developed. Then moving on to the infective etiology, we have few gram positive organisms, then we have few gram negative aerobes, especially with gram negative predominant. Most commonly, it is the Pseudomonas aerogenos so followed by. Proteus mirabilis, Proteus vulgaris, as well as Staphylococcus aureus. In case of uh, uh, the latest uh, uh, Scott Brown edition, it gives Proteus mirabilis forming 75-95 percentage of the development of this chronic arthritis media. Staphylococcus aureus forming almost 40 percentage, and Pseudomonas forming 30 percentage. Earlier edition, they have told Pseudomonas is the one which is predominating, but the latest edition has changed the microbiological picture. Why Pseudomonas aerogenosa in the development of this uh, uh, chronic arthritis media? Predilection for moist areas. Pseudomonas aerogenosa acts or sits over the moist areas. The middle ear, as you know, is a six sided cuboidal structure which is uh, having this ventilation as well as the mucosal clearance. So, when there is an infection over here, the pseudomonas, uh, pseudomonas happily sits over there. Then, infect tissues by adherence to the epithelial cells by pilar fibrae. Normal tissues resist such attachment. So, what is the uh, 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 second thing is like once it goes, once it's over there, it attaches by pili or fimbriae, not by normal attachment. So, tissue resistance is ineffective or uh, the resistance provided by the tissues are not sufficient for this uh, to, ex to expel the pseudomonas out. And as well as this serum, which is uh, having antibacterial activity is ineffective against pseudomonas. So recent studies have shown anaerobes also contribute to the development of this chronic arthritis media. Most common uh, anaerobes are uh, bacillus meningogenes as well as fragilis. Then this obstruction of this air around the granulation. So whenever there is a production of this granulation tissue, what is happening? Obstruction of air around, around the granulation. This leads to reduction of oxygen, inverse increase in the carbon dioxide, anaerobes multiply. So this acts as the medium or the chamber for this uh, anaerobes to multiply. This is the reason for this uh, anaerobes to predominate. Previous arthritis media. What is the commonest cause for the development of chronic arthritis media is the previous history of arthritis media. Acute arthritis media or acute separative arthritis media was uh, elderly called. 70% of the infants, majority will have, majority of the time, it will heal. But in few cases where there is persistence of inflammation or relapse of this acute arthritis media, this acute arthritis media will go to a chronically discharging ear. This is the reason for the development of acute arthritis media, especially in case of children. Also, the children will have a wider eustachian tube, which is more flatter and more play horizontally placed, which is also one of the reasons for the development of this uh, persistence of this infection, leading to acute uh, arthritis media, which in turn lead to chronic arthritis media. Then we have 
acute necrotizing, necrotizing arteritis media acute necrotizing arteritis media is a variant of arteritis media uh -huh. wherein there is a viral prodrome followed by secondary bacterial infection once the bacterial infection supervenes especially with the pseudomonas what will happen there is complete destruction of the epithelium right from the external auditory canal to the middle ear and the mastoid air cell system leading to complete necrosis of this entire middle ear cleft structures leading to development of this chronic arteritis media then chronic secretory arteritis media chronic secretory arteritis media is otherwise called as serous arteritis media or blue ear which is a very common presentation or very common reason for childhood deafness in case of school going children and this chronic uh, secretory arteritis media is developed because of uh, problem with persistence of this uh, eustachian tubule inflammation again the eustachian tube is shorter wider and more horizontally placed so there is many a chances that the fluid gets accumulated in the eustachian tube which uh, leads to development of this uh, secretory arteritis media this chronic secretory arteritis media can lead to any form of chronic arteritis media not just mucosal it may lead to squamosal variant also so this is one of the important etiological aspect with respect to the previous history of arteritis media so acute necrotizing uh, arteritis media where there's a uh, triple uh, prolonged attack okay there is a painless perforation in a short span of time what is happening is there is a perforation because from epithelium everything is getting eroded so what is happening is there is a painless perforation in a short span of time child with lower gen general resistance plus virus plus bacteria this is the triple attack child with lowered resistance the immunity of the child which uh, is very less as, as such then there is a super added viral infection then super added bacterial infection so uh, poor child with protein deficiency and low immunity again they are at the risk of developing this uh, acute necrotizing arteritis media then viral exanthematous fevers are also and the bacterial causes are bacterial beta chemolytic streptococci which acts as the reason for this uh, supersided bacterial infection to grow areas with poorest blood supply especially they succumb to toxins okay so in uh, cases of uh, middle ear and the mastoid air cell system the ossicles as well as the other regions which has poor blood supply they succumb for the toxins pro uh, produced by this beta chemolytic streptococci then uh, this leads to perforation which is uh, painless perforation which is uh, central perforation and it is kidney shaped in the area of the past tensor extent of initial necro necrosis determines the end result so this acute necrotizing arteritis media as we see whatever was the extent of the initial necrosis what is the necrosis which is happening at the initial level that determines the end result of the same so what are the uh, grading and severity so if it is a mild case mild case of acute necrotizing arteritis externa which is confining itself to the past tensa and usual asym process usually what is happening the stage of resolution stage of uh, all those uh, sequelae will happen some similar to asym then restoration and reso resolution of the tympanic membrane to normal tympanic membrane heals with the thin scar and remain open either dry or benign type of otorrhea which is a COM mucosal variant if it is a moderate moderate type of uh, acute necrotizing arteritis media the annulus succumbs okay the peripheral annular ligament the annulus succumbs tympanic mucoperiosteum is necros ossicles and the bony sulcus are eroded healing occurs by ingrowth of neatal skin or the respiratory mucosa of the eustachian tube leading to polysteatoma formation then on the severe variant where we have mucoperiosteum of the antrum which is completely getting er eroded dissolved exposing bare bone over there deprived of the nutrition when there is a, a deprivation of this nutrition what is happening there is a formation of the sequestrum and the, this leads to development of osteomyelitis so this will go for bone erosion happening eustachian tube inadequacy eustachian tubal dysfunction which we have seen already is due to functional most of the time it is functional inadequacy defective opening especially patients with cleft palate for so the most common example is patients with cleft palating they will have functional eustachian tubal inadequacy then persistent collapse or uh, collapse of abnormally compliant eustachian tube patless eustachian tube or persistent tubal opening again that is uh, one more reason for the development of this tubal dysfunction mechanical mostly it is of allergic mucosa allergic mucosal edema inflammatory edema adenoid enlargement and nasopharyngeal carcinoma what is happening with respect to the allergy is there is invariably the mucociliary lining which is getting prone for allergy this leads to allergic mucosal edema then we have inflammation inflammatory 
process which is subliminal subclinically going on again this leads to development of edema as well as adenoid enlargement adenoid enlargement will have obstruction of the eustachian tubal opening at the level of the nasopharynx leading to the development of tubal dysfunction or nasopharyngeal carcinoma again the nasopharynx is the one where the nasopharyngeal carcinoma enlarges initial stages stage 1 and stage 2 of the nasopharyngeal carcinoma it uh, enlarges and obstructs the tubal opening leading to uh, defective functioning of the eustachian tube especially the ventilatory function as well as the drainage function of the eustachian tube is altered leading on to middle ear inflammation as well as a chronic otitis media iatrogenic perforation due to ventilation tube insertion in case of uh, secretory otitis media the treatment option for the chronic secretory otitis media or the grew ear or the secretory uh, otitis media is insertion of the ventilation tube okay so what is happening once there is ventilation tube we artificially make a nick in the tympanic membrane we expel out the fluid from the middle ear then we insert the tube 50 percentage of the ear suffer at least one episode of otorrhea after tube uh, tubal uh, tube ventilation tube insertion and removal what is happening 50 percentage of the ear suffer at least one episode of otorrhea three percentage persistent discharge for more than six weeks of duration residual perforation rate due to extrusion of the ventilation tube short-term residual perforation is seen in somewhere around two three to three percentage whereas long-term residual perforation is seen in somewhere around 47 to 50 percentage so almost 50 percentage of the year will have a residual perforation this is one of the major reasons for the development of chronic otitis uh, media mucosal variant especially there is a hydrogenic perforation made at the level of pars tensor for draining the serious otitis media other causes genetic increased in eskimos and the native americans for unknown reasons eskimos and native americans are at the risk of developing this chronic otitis media difficult to answer due to confounding factors immunological hypogamma global immunia there is the defective immunoglobin levels which leads to immuno uh, development of this chronic otitis media then immune suppression especially hiv hiv and aids are one of the important or uh, uh, major key factors for the development of uh, chronic arthritis media especially in patients who has been immunosuppressed other causes upper respiratory tract infection not uh, not studied scientifically but the, this has been postulated as the one of the reasons for the development of this uh, chronic arthritis media also affects the mucosa of the middle ear less uh, less resistant to the organism bacterial overgrowth in the middle ear allergy also has been postulated as the development of this chronic otitis media to be proven allergic individuals have higher incidence of chronic otitis media hysteria tubal malfunction hysteria tube is blocked by the edema patulous and allows nasopharyngeal secretions down syndrome and cleft palate especially tensor villi palatine muscles are hypoplastic and it uh, uh, the initiating factor or the result of com is not known so tubal uh, malfunction is by blockage by the edema, patulous by the nasopharyngeal secretions, and defective palat uh, um, tensor valley palatine muscle leading to defective uh, clearance of this secretion. GRD, gastroesophageal reflex disorders, has been postulated in the recent times. Why? Because GRD will have chronic uh, laryngopharyngitis. Once the reflex secretions comes into the nasopharynx, then this ascends, it touches the eustachian tubal area, especially over the pharyngeal end of the eustachian tubal area leading to inflammatory response or evoking inflammatory response only anecdotal evidence exists but it is not proven scientifically pathological type persistent mucosal disease why persistent uh, uh, when we say persistent mucosal disease why this mucosal disease has to be persistent what are the reasons for this persistence of the disease one it is the persistence of the infection or recurrent infection these two are the reasons for the development of this persistent mucosal disease so the focus of infection for the persistent mucosal disease will be in the adenoids tonsils and sinuses okay so especially in uh, uh, children who are uh, uh, at the risk of developing this chronic arthritis uh, chronic secretory arthritis media where there is adenoid enlargement or if there is a son, uh, tonsil enlargement or the patient is having uh, coexistent sinusitis they all will act as a nidus for this infection to develop. So this leads to persistence. Nasopharynx and the external meatus also plays a role. Repeated infection, mucosal changes. Repeated infections in the uh, middle ear mucosa will have these mucosal changes, formation of a polyp or formation of granulation, uh, granulation or formation of retraction pockets. All these things has been postulated in the development of the secondary acute polysteatoma, also in the 
uh, reason for the persistence of this infections. So types of this uh, persistent mucosal disease. So once there is a constant inflammation in the mucosa, what is happening? It may have this uh, mucosal variants, especially you have tubal, tubal especially. That means the eustachian tubal area and the opening area and the hypotympanic area is the one which is involved over there. Then we have the tympanic variant, which is called as where in tympanic mucosa, which is edematous and hyperplastic prolapses into the polyp and it projects as a EAC polyp. Then tympanomastoid, where there is a mucosal changes extending to the mastoid system. So all this has been mucosal only, of which something is limited only with the tubal mucosa, something is going to the tympanic mucosa, something, uh, the third variant, it goes into the tympanomastoid system also. Permanent perforation syndrome. You have a defect in the past tensor. The edges of the perforation are killed. So the perforation remains permanent. Okay. This is the second uh, syndrome which happens. So the edges are perforated. There is no chance of uh, re epithelialization over happening over there. So this is uh, called as uh, permanent perforation syndrome. Mechanical defect in the tympanic membrane. Risk of recurrent infection of the middle ear, which leads to upper respiratory tract infection through estuation tube or water from the estuation. Uh, external auditory canal may percolate through this uh, perforation leading to permanent perforation syndrome. Stages uh, based on the um, duration of the ear discharge, it is divided into few stages. Active stage is one which is called as when there is a discharging ear up to three months. So you have a discharging ear for more than three months or so, then it is called as active stage. When you have a quiescent stage wherein there is no discharge, for a period somewhere around three to six months. So it is called as quiescent stage. Then we have inactive stage where there is no discharge at all for a period more than six months. Healed means the perforation has healed with the thin tympanic membrane. So these are the few stages in case of chronic otitis media mucosal where active for less, three, less than three months, quiescent three to six months, inactive more than six months and healed means there is a perforation which has healed. So uh, moving on to the clinical features, how the patient will present to you. Usually the symptoms are votoria. That means there is an abundant ear discharge. The ear discharge is profuse because uh, there is hyper secretion of the mucus secreting goblet cells of the middle ear, which is going for hyper uh, stimulation. The discharge is profuse. Then the discharge may be mucoid or mucopurulent. Initially, the discharge is mucoid because there is no secondary bacterial infection. Once the bacterial infection supersedes, then this leads to mucopurulent discharge and there may, there may be presence of intermittent discharge associated with upper respiratory tract infection. Whenever there is an episode of upper respiratory tract infection, the inflammation ascends up. So, there will be profuse. Once the upper respiratory tract infection settles down and the edema and the inflammation of the mucosa settles down, then this leads to waxing, weaning course of this. That's why it is intermittent and it is not false smelling. There is no bone erosion. So there is no false smelling that, and it is not blood stain. There is no presence of granulation. There is no oral polyp or there is no uh, periosteal erosion. So there is non blood staining and there is a progressive hearing loss. The second most common presentation in case of chronic otitis media is a progressive hearing loss or it may be a mass. Mass means nothing but a hyper uh, hypertrophied uh, middle ear mucosa which is protruding out of this uh, perforation which is called as mass protruding from the middle ear canal. So what are the signs when uh, looking at the signs of uh, this one? The first and foremost thing we have to look into the perforation. What are the, uh, what is, what are the things which has to be seen in case of perforation? First and foremost thing is the type of perforation. The first and foremost, whether it is a anterior perforation, posterior perforation, a small perforation, medium perforation, large perforation. Then the second thing which has to be seen is the edges of the perforation. The edges of the perforation, whether it is a smooth margin or the edges are irregular or the edges are epithelialized, all these things will give clue to how we are addressing the disease. Then number of perforation, multiple perforations are seen in tuberculosis. Then uh, through the perforation, one can see the status of the middle ear mucosa. It is whether it is pale, pink or edematous in case of active disease, whether it is uh, edematous, hyperplastic, velvety or polypoidal in case of uh, other presentations. Then coralization, that means uh, the tympanic membrane over there will become thickened due to deposition of this hyaline, uh, hyaline uh, crystals. This is called as coralization. Also development of tympanosclerosis, which is a patchy opaque uh, uh, deposition of the uh, 
again the hyaline substance on the surface of the tympanic membrane which is a sign of healed uh, tympanic membrane usually the perforation is central if it is a, a, we call it a small when it is involving only one quadrant and it is medium which is if it involves two quadrants large if it involves three quadrants subtotal all the four quadrants are involved with the intact annulus whereas in case of total perforation all the four quadrants are involved with the law even the loss of this fibrous annulus fibrous annulus is nothing but the peripheral rim of the tympanic membrane where it is thickened so in case of uh, total perforation the all the four quadrants of the pars tensor has been involved even with the loss of this fibrous annulus so this is a diagrammatic view showing the central perforation which is small in which is involving only one quadrant which is a medium in case second diagram which is uh, involving two quadrants and then it is a uh, subtotal involving all the four quadrants total perforation all the four quadrants are involved even with the loss of this uh, fibrous annulus even with the fibrous annulus what are the features of this permanent perforation syndrome once the per per perforation is permanent what is happening then this become fissured that means it becomes inactive for some time middle ear mucosa is pale pink dry and there is no focus of granulation or keratinization if it is active we have profuse discharge as we said it is a profuse non non fault smelling mucopurulent then the tympanic muc membrane mucosa will be swollen and edematous the ossicular chain usually remains intact and there is no ossicular erosion and it is mobile the ossicular uh, ossicular continuity is maintained so this is a uh, various uh, representation showing a dry perforation where we can see the status of the middle ear mucosa in the first diagram almost uh, la subtotal perforation we can see about the handle uh, uh, enclosed epidural joint as well as the hypotympanic axis in the second diagram we can see the middle ear mucosa is pale wet and uh, poly uh, uh, pinkish in appearance the middle ear the, this diagram is preliminary for showing the middle ear mucosa then tubal type uh, <coughs> tubal type is seen in a cataral child where there is a presence of anterior perforation and uh, there is profuse discharge inflammation of the tubal as tu peritubal as well as hypotypanic cells will lead to development of this tubal variant search for source of infection in the sinus as well as the adenoid if there is a tubal uh, type then we have to search the source for the sinus and the adenoids tympanic large perforation with retraction hyperplastic and edematous mucosa oral polyp oral polyp is uh, pale probable painless and it is pliable and pedunculated and it is smooth promont it usually it starts from the promontory or the tubal opening and it may go to the oval window or the round window area so removal of this uh, oral polyp ends a cul de sac will lead to labyrinthitis also if there is uh, obstruction of the tubal opening or the start if the oral polyp starts in the tubal opening it blocks the drainage of the tubes flare up with the upper respiratory tract infection and swimming so the tympanic variant will have flare ups during upper respiratory tract infection especially swimming what what is happening the water percolates through the perforation leading to development of this uh, infection history of vertigo deafness always suspect labyrinthine involvement whenever the patient with the tubal tympanic variant is uh, saying a uh, history of vertigo or deafness then labyrinthitis has to be suspected the third variant of the persistent uh, perforation syndrome is the tympanomastoid variant where there is uh, extension to the mastoid axis system representation into the mastoid pulsatile discharge especially from the posterior part so posterior perforation with a pulsatile discharge that means there is extension to the tympanomastoid system severe conductive deafness poor response to oral toilet may go for secondary acute cholesteatoma these are the patients who always go for secondary acute cholesteatoma especially the tympanomastoid variant where there is a posterior perforation so when you do tuning fork test clinical examination or um, this one negative on the affected cell uh, depending on the severity it can be categorized into mild moderate and severe conductive hearing loss we were laterally to the affected cell absolute bone conduction test will be same as that of the examiner what are the reasons for the conductive hearing loss to develop in case of uh, permanent perforation syndrome because of the perforation okay the perforation itself will act as a uh, reason for this conductive deafness to develop then heel tympanic membrane with the uh, disrupted disrupted uh, ossicular chain mucosal changes mucosal changes in the uh, middle ear system then the status of the ossicles ossicular uh, discontinuity or the ossicular erosion also will play a role then fluid in the ear with perforation whenever whenever there is um, entry of this fluid into the ear then they lead to uh, development of uh, tympanomastoid uh, variant of this uh, uh, permanent perforation syndrome leading to development of 
conductive shearing loss. Anterior perforation offers no deafness as there is no reduction in the baffling effect. There is one effect which is called as round window baffling effect, which is the nothing but the phase difference which is maintained between the oval window and the round window. So, in anterior perforation, there is no uh, baffling, uh, uh, no reduction of this baffling effect. So, there is no uh, conductive, much of conductive hearing loss. Whereas in case of posterior perforation, more severe deafness due to reduction of this baffling effect. In healed tympanic membrane with disrupted ossicular chain, the maximum conductive deafness which can be seen is somewhere around 60 decibel. Mucosal changes, edema of the mucosa adjacent to the ossicles, mobility is restricted, this is extending to the mastoid, resonance of the mastoid is dampened. All these things are mucosal changes which can happen. For the ossicles, the most common ossicular discontinuity is at the level of the incudostepidial joint. Reduced blood supply or the delicate structure of the incus leading to aseptic necrosis of the long process of the incus leading to dissolution and discontinuity of the incudostepidial joint. <clears throat> the, um, whereas in case of fast, uh, this one, there is to total separation of the incus from the uh, stapes. Whereas in case of um, uh, slowly progressive disease, deposition of the fibrous tissue, which replaces the blown low frequency from uh, getting transmitted audiogram, conductive hearing loss at a high frequency, then low frequency. Sensor neural uh, hearing loss. Uh, what are the reasons for the development of sensor neural hearing loss in a patient with mucosal variant? Usually, passage of the bacterial toxin across the round window to the cochlea. Okay, then pulling of the oral polyp with bony erosion underneath. Okay, whenever we try to pull up the pluck the oral polyp, then this leads to uh, sensor neural hearing loss because labyrinth is involved. Then, what are the investigation? Moving on to the further part, the investigation examination under microscope or rigid endoscopy is the confirmatory test or confirmatory for our diagnosis. Then, culture and sensitivity. If the patient is in the active stage, we can go for culture sensitivity of the ear discharge. Patch testing is nothing but application of a thin paper, uh, uh, butter paper over the perforation to look for whether how much is the hearing improvement. After. So, we can roughly predict what is the surgical outcome of the patient. This is again a uh, test which is done at the OPD basis. Then we have the pure tone audiometric assay, we, wherein we assess, uh, assess the hearing at the specific frequencies. Then bilateral x ray mastoids, then HRCT temporal bones, bilateral HRCT temporal bones, then hysteresian tubal patency testing. All these things have been uh, for, formulated as the investigations for the development uh, for. Uh, uh, chronic arthritis media, mucosal variant, otomicroscopy. Why you need, we do need to go for the otomicroscopy to see the margins of the perforation, to see the middle ear mucosa, to see the uh, status of the ossicular chain, to rule out the ingrowth of the epithelium, to see granulation or polyp, to see any evidence of cholesteatoma for collection of ear swab for sensitivity. All these things are the reasons for why which we go for otomicroscopy or otoendoscopy. Rigid endoscope, usually we use zero degree rigid endoscope, which was proposed by Mir and his colleagues in the year 1967. The advantages of rigid endoscope over the microscope is to visualize the anterior recess, detailed anatomy of the middle ear through the perforation. Suppose if the perforation is a subtotal perforation or a total perforation, through the perforation, we can insert the uh, uh, zero degree endoscope into the middle ear mucosa. So we can have a detailed anatomy of the perforation. So this is the pure tone audiogram of assay showing mild conductive hearing loss in the right ear, whereas case of severe conductive hearing loss in the right ear in the, with large airborne gap. So the conductive hearing loss airborne gap should be more than 20 decibel. So for a larger airborne gap, which suggests there is ossicular discontinuity. Patch test, again, which is performed as a OPD procedure. The materials used are cigarette paper, tissue paper, or gel foam, or butter paper. PTA done before, after the repeat patch testing. Hearing inputs, that means ossicles are intact versus ossicular disruption. So when, uh, when we do patch testing, after patch testing, if there is an improvement in the hearing, that means the ossicles are intact. Or if there is a worsening of the hearing, that means what is happening, the ossicles are disrupted. Radiological assessment, usually what we'll do is last lateral oblique view, which is 15 degree view in the sagittal plane, X-ray of the skull parallel to the film and the X-ray beam is projected at 15 degree FLO caudal region. What we have to see is looking for the ex bony external auditory meatus on the one side, then followed by the key area of the mastoid, which is nothing but the attic aditus and the antrum. So we the largest uh, single common arcel which is seen in the X-ray mastoid is the mastoid antrum. So looking, looking, look, we also we always look for the honeycombing of the pattern. The three patterns which are described with respect to the X-ray mastoids are the <coughs> uh, pneumatic mastoid, 
sclerotic mastoid and diploic mastoid. Pneumatic means the air cells are intact, whereas in sclerosis means the air cells are has been replaced with fluid. Diploic means both are in together. Then reading of the X-ray mastoid, whether it is a region, uh, uh, plane or contrast uh, X-ray mastoid, nose or uh, this one, which view of the mastoid, important anatomical lam landmarks, pathological findings and the diagnosis. So types of pneumatization, as we said, it may be cellular, well pneumatic, uh, pneumatized, or a cellular sclerotic or diploid mustard. Position of the dural plate and the sinus plate has to be seen. Presence of bony destruction has to be seen. Presence of mastoid cavity has to be seen. Presence of cholesteatoma or the cotton bull appearance in the mastoid, uh, X-ray mastoid, or all these findings has to be seen when reading the X-ray mastoid. The other uh, views for the X-ray mastoid are Schuller's view, Stenberg's view, Town's view, transorbital view, full view or submento, occipital view. All these things has been uh, other views for the X-ray mastoids. CT scan, anatomy of the temporal bone can be more effectively demonstrated with the higher resolution contrast tomography. Detection of the intracranial complications should include at least two projections. Okay, So the eustachian tubal platency has been tested by pulse cell eustachian tubal and the middle ear has been inflated by forceful closed expiration. Patent eustachian uh, <coughs> tubal functions have been described. Then the other way of dis uh, describing eustachian tubal patency is by polystrization. One of the end of the rubber tube is in the one nariz on the other end into the airbag. Other nariz compressed with the fingers. Positive nasopharyngeal pressure transmitted to the middle ear. Point B test is with swallow, uh, swallow the uh, saliva with nose closed. Middle ear pressure increases and then decreases. We can see the uh, movement of the tympanic membrane. So moving on to the treatment, if once we diagnose, once we uh, look for the tubal patency, our aim is to arrest the disease, secure the condition to allow, allow the tissues to the normal. So what are the uh, treatment options available? First and foremost thing, we can go for oral toileting. Oral toileting is by use of cotton buds. Fluffy, attached to the Jobson on probe, removes liquid easily. Dry mobbing of the discharge can be done. Debris removal is very difficult. But antro inferior, which is difficult to clean, can be done. Fear of infection, hence sterile. It has to be uh, sterile. Browning in the year 1984 has demonstrated 85 percentage of cessation of the discharge with active, proper, sterile oral toileting alone. Then we can place a wick, which is called as depot delivery system. Then we can go for suction aspiration, which was uh, first described by Vero and Vero and, and his colleagues. This is the most common technique, most popular techniques. Breaks down the procrit of infection and allows the drainage. Needs expertise. General anesthesia is required usually in case of children. And if there is accidental injury into the inner ear structures, they may go for vertigo. So suction aspiration has to be very meticulous. Then syringing practiced in some centers, some centers which is not routinely uh, uh, <clears throat> advocated to the patients. Materials are usually one percentage acetic acid or physiological saline or water with white vinegar can remove the debris easily. The advantages of doing syringing is it removes the debris easily. Then there are chances of uh, uh, cross infection and vertigo due to temperature change as well as inner ear stimulation. Then topical antimicrobial scans being used, they have antiseptic action. It provides acidic medium, aluminum acetate, spirit and phenol, which has the acidic medium, which prevents the growth of the bacteria. Then we have antibiotics, especially beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillin, which is discontinued these days. Then chloramphenicol has been used, aminoglycosate, especially your gentamicin or fluoroquinolones, especially ciprofloxin, ofloxin, all, all this has been used for topical, this one. The displacement system, which is mentioned over here, we have to give intermittent pressure on the triggers so that what is happening through the perforation, the uh, drug will go into the middle ear mucosa. Also, it comes into the eustachian tube. This is what is mentioned in the diagram C. Then amino glycosides, which are used are neomycin, effective against proteus and the staphylococcus aureus, ineffective against gram-negative anaerobes, limited action against pseudomonas. Polymyxin, effective against pseudomonas, ineffective against gram-positive organisms. Quinolones, we are, quinolones, which are commonly used are ciprofloxin and ofloxin, which are active against pseudomonas, hemophilus influenza and microphilus cactylis, and MRSA are resistant. Oral antibiotics start on broad spectrum antibiotics till culture sensitivity report comes. Usually, aminoglycosides, lack of activity, quinolones, excellent anti-pseudomonal activity. So, we prefer quinolones 
third generation or second generation filaments. So the points to ponder are the principles involved for various techniques to and can apply to the moist areas and position of the defect. Large perforations are more difficult to close as they are more difficult to stabilize and have a smaller recipient blood supply. Very small perforations may be providing a ventilation into a naturally poorly ventilated tube. Freshening of the margins is very important. Application of fine elastic sheet oil, oil silk or a tissue paper to cover the defect is one of the important aspects. Pre-operative CT, it is uh, done to determine the extent of the disease, temple bone pneumatization, anatomical variations, what, especially a low-lying duva, low-lying tegment, and a forward-lying uh, large anterior or forward-lying sigmoid sinus, anomalous facial nerves. All these things has been uh, looked up in the preoperative CT. For permanent perforation syndrome, for smaller perforation, if you can use uh, cautery. For medium to large perforation, if the airborne gap is less than 40 decibel with no uh, ascular involvement, you can go for meringoplasty. If it is uh, more than 40 decibel, you can go for tympanoplasty. Cautery, the cautery material used are topical anesthesia of margins with 4% cot uh, xylocaine. Then small bead of cotton is found tightly wound at the end of the applicator which is uh, the cautery material which is used is your trichloroacetic acid. Stroke inward to outward, right? 0.5 millimeter wide cautery, uh, cautery's margins usually should be visible. Repeat weekly, so new ring growing margin can be seen. This is with the help of your trichloroacetic acid. Then surgical principle, the principle for the surgical management to eradicate the disease and promote healing. Then to prevent recurrence of the infection, to prevent complication and to restore the functions of the middle ear. These are the principles which guide the surgery for the patient. So of which eradication of the disease and restoration of functions are foremost principles. For the tubo tympanic uh, variant or the tubal variant of the persistent mucosal disease, uh, meringoplasty after puberty, if the perforation does not heal, is the option. For the tympanic variant, removal of the oral polyp, snare, uh, uh, snare is not recommended. Repair of the ossicles, uh, then cortical mastoidectomy if there is a persistent discharge. For the tympanomastoid variant, cortical mastoidectomy with tympanoplasty is the most preferred uh, way of dealing with the patients. What is the difference between a meringoplasty and tympanoplasty? Meringoplasty is nothing but a reconstruction of the perforation of the tympanic membrane. Assumes normal middle mucosa and the ossicle tympanic membrane is not elevated from its sulcus. Whereas in case of tympanic tympanoplasty, it is to eradicate the disease of the middle ear and to reconstruct the hearing mechanism with or without tympanic membrane grafting. Also, it includes addressing the middle ear pathology, especially polycytoma, additions, ossicular chain problems, and it also you. Uh, helps in elevating the tympanic membrane from this sulcus. Tympanoplasty was uh, described by Willistan in the year 1952. Much earlier, Berthold and uh, Tagman uh, predicted the meringoplasty. Uh, as defined by Willistan in 1952, it is uh, tympanoplasty is an operation whose goal is to absolute healing of the aerated spaces of autobase from the eustachian tube to the cells in the occipital bone at the primate. It is applicable to any inflammation, trauma or benign neoplasm and includes reconstruction of the optimal system of the middle ear for function in one operation. It is tailored to the type and the extent of the disease. Basically, the approaches to the uh, ear are permeatal approach, endoral approach, and postoral approach. Postoral approach gives excellent anterior, uh, excellent view for the anterior recess. Fascia is also easily accessible. We have various, uh, this one, criteria for a functioning middle ear, intact elastic tympanic membrane, a ventilated middle ear space, mobile and abstracted oval window or the round window, and mechanism of mechanism to link tympanic membrane to the oval window has to be managed. Indications for surgery, conductive hearing loss for more than 30 decibel in a year with good cochlear reserve, progressive hearing loss due to chronic middle ear pathology, perforation or hearing loss persistent for more than three months due to trauma, infection or surgery, inability to take bath or participate in the watery sports safely. All these things has been indication for performing surgery in case of uh, uh, mucosal variant. Absolute contraindications, it's a dead ear, poor cochlear reserve, malignant neoplasm of the external ear or the middle ear, middle ear with the fibrocystic sclerosis, hydrogenic cholesteatoma, or it is the only hearing ear, or intracranial complications which are arising, all these things has been postulated as contraindications for the for surgery. Relative contraindications are acute exacerbation of CSYM, dysfunction of the eustachian tube, then chronic external audit is due to pseudomonas, aspergillus, and staphylococcus, patients less than five years of age. So all these things are the relative contraindications for um, 
performing surgery prerequisites dry year and there is no disease in the year no there is no predisposing factors audiometry and tuning focus shows bone conduction better than air conduction adequate cochlear function patent is tissue tube muscular chain continuity is preserved and normal middle ear mucosa is present then what are the types of surgeries uh, you can have tympanic uh, tympanoplasty types with sound pressure transformation sound pressure protection so for sound pressure transformation tra we basically transform the sound in type 1 hearing is achieved by anatomically and functionally intact lever mechanism in uh, type 2 abnormal reconstructed hearing mechanism has been restored in type 3 hearing is achieved without a lever mechanism but with sound pressure transformation via a columnar system which is called as miringo stepido plexi in type 4 hearing is achieved with sound protection okay and in uh, type 5 the middle ear cavity is closed and the hearing is achieved by sound protection for the for the round window with simultaneous obstruction of the oval window what are the graph materials which are used for tympanoplasty? You have autograph, we have full thickness skin graft as well as split thickness skin graft. Initially, we will have good results, subsequent desformation and infection with high delayed failure rate. Canal skin similar to the split skin graft. We can also use fat, we can also use a vein graft, which is a shear graft. Then we can also use facial data, we can also use periosteum or you can use cartilage, especially tragal cartilage as well as the tragal peri uh, pericontrium. Temporal fascia, which was uh, uh, proposed by Heerman and his colleagues, Cross in the year 1960, obtained of any size, thickness is same as that of the normal tympanic membrane, provides good resistance to infection, no separate insertion is needed and the metabolic rate is low or it is almost biologically equivalent to that of the tympanic membrane. Homographs available are tympanic membrane, cadaveric fascia and vein graft, dural grafts, excellent success similar to the fascia, theoretical risk of infectious disease transmission, especially prion slow viral disease and availability. How we are, how well we are procuring the dura is other question. The technique which are used for covering the tympanic membrane is especially overlay technique as well as underlay technique. Overlay technique is called as lateral grafting, underlay technique is called as medial grafting. Posterior incision is taken, harvesting of the temporal fascia is done, then elevation of the vascular flap or the pedicular flap is done, <coughs> then sheet complete removal of the tympanic membrane epithelium. The edges of the perforation are uh, uh, freshened so that uh, the, uh, the epithelialization happens, then shaping of the feria, uh, fascia to the graft uh, the uh, temporal fascia harvested is uh, taken and it is uh, reshaped so that it goes and sits over the residual tympanic membrane replacing of the canal skin the canal skin which was taken initially has to be replaced and then it is uh, closed with a uh, <coughs> bandage uh, dressing the complications are infection. Poor aseptic technique will lead to infection, poor contamin prior contamination, or graft failure is associated with post-operative infection. The reasons for graft failure are infection, inadequate packing, especially of the anterior mesotympanum, inadequate overlay of the graft with the remnant tympanic membrane, or remnant, which is leading to underlay technique. <clears throat> Osseoplasty. Osseoplasty is nothing but a procedure which is involving reconstruction of the ossicular chain. Uh, Hall and the right now performed the first osteologous ossicular reconstruction. It was in the year 1976, the uh, introduction of the plastipore was used. Then in 1979, the ceramic implants with hydroxy appetite. Graft are the synthetic implants, no foreign body reaction, no extrusion, no biodegradation, no ankylosis with bony walls of the tympanum. Maintain acoustic transmission, no newborn formation or evidence of inflammation. This is the PARP and the TOR processes which has been placed uh, during your ossicular reconstruction. Summary of the uh, uh, operative procedures, we have cortical mastoidectomy, radical anterior tympanostomy, posterior tympanostomy and combined approach mastoidectomy. Whereas in case of reconstructive side, we have miringoplasty, osteoploplasty and tympanoplasty. Cortical mastoidectomy, cortical mastoidectomy for the short standing uh, chronic arthritis media cases where otorrhea is believed to be due to mastoid reservoir. Whereas in case of modified radical mastoidectomy, extensive so as to require complete amputation and it's possible to restore the function. It's a historical precursor of the tympanoplasty. Combined approach mastoidectomy, anterior tympanoplasty access to the tympanic cavity by reflecting posterior metal wall, skinny, that is in continuity with the membrane. By this, it is possible to inspect round window or if ossicular chain is damaged for ossiculoplasty, whereas in case of posterior tympanotomy, access to the anterior attic antrum of the facial recess. This completes the topic of uh, chronic arthritis media mucosal variant. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you all.